morning church. We are coming this morning from a super secret backup location, also known as we spent the night down in Sparta because we were celebrating the fourth late last night. But we're still talking about wisdom. Of course, wisdom is actually one of the things I've been meaning to say through this series, the underpinning of almost everything that we do talk about. I think wisdom is what God is trying to teach us. Wisdom, in many ways, is what love looks like when it's put into action, when we learn to love well. But today I want to take a break from the Psalms. Um, Psalms will kind of be through the summer and the early fall, a sort of series that we bounce in and out of, and we're going to bounce out of it for today to talk about something else. This is something that I started to touch on, or tried to start touching on, in my Wednesday night class on Colossians that I'm recording right now. But I know that um, a lot of people can't make that. <clears throat> and I think this is worth saying in times like these. I think this is a major point of what Paul is trying to say in Scripture. And so, or what Scripture overall, not just Paul, really is trying to teach us. So I want to bounce out of the Psalms just for today and probably bounce back into the Psalms next week. So let's begin with the Scripture reading this morning. Galatians chapter 3, this is one that's familiar to us. Uh, we will start in verse 27 and go down through verse 28. This is coming at the end of, this is the conclusion of uh, this long text in Galatians chapter 3 about what salvation, or rather how salvation works, how Jesus justifies us, brings us into the family of God. So this is the conclusion there. All of you who were baptized into Christ Jesus have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now the basic thing I want us to talk about this morning is that how we read a text like that is a vitally important task in the life of a church because there are a variety of different ways of reading it. Uh, in the churches of Christ we have primarily come along in a tradition that is increasingly individualistic and we do that naturally enough because we live in a world that is increasingly individualistic. We uh, are a nation built upon the notion of individualism the value and the autonomy and the power of the individual, and that's not all bad. Um, there is a certain strength to being able to see the dignity of the individual, or the uniqueness of the individual, or the worth of the individual, and not losing that completely in some broader whole. But what we find is that sometimes when we focus so much on the individual, that we lose sight of bigger things. Uh, we lose, as the cliche goes, the for or the trees, or the forest rather, I haven't had enough caffeine this morning, we lose the forest for the trees. And sometimes it's what happens here. Because in my lifetime, salvation has often been construed as an almost entirely individual thing. In the churches of Christ, for the most part where I grew up, we didn't use the language of a personal relationship with Jesus. But we um, still emphasize the same sorts of things, just with different language. It was a private decision in which nobody else had much to say about it. Every individual had to make that decision, and that's about as far as it went. And so, the way that plays out in practical ways is that when uh, big society-wide issues come up, uh, matters of injustice, for instance, things like that, things that some might deem political, and we're not even going to get into what that means or doesn't mean this morning, but a common call that you will hear coming from this individualism is that we don't need to focus on that injustice or this social issue or that thing that is going on that affects our neighbors in the broader world. We as the church have not been called to get into politics, we will say, again, not discussing what that means or doesn't mean this morning because we don't have time for that today. But rather we will say the church exists to save souls. And so coming at it from that perspective, our job is not to 
address or critique or offer a counter testimony to the structures of the world, the way that neighbors interact with one another, the way that societies or communities form or are operated, but rather our job, we presume, is to focus on individuals. We need to get individual souls into this state that we call salvation. And so what we've done to, traditionally from, from that framework with texts like Galatians chapter 3, 26 and 27, or 27 and 28 rather, is we've read those through that individualist lens, through that, that individualism focus. And so we would say, for instance, that when Paul says there is no more Jew, there is no more Greek, there is no more slave, there is no more free, there is no more male, there is no more female, what that means is that salvation is open to any of those people. It doesn't, we would say, have um, social implications. It doesn't change the way that we really order or look at society or even change whether or not we should be concerned with issues about how society is ordered. It's simply saying that the gospel of salvation entering from this state of unsaved into this state of saved is available to anyone. And of course that is in itself a powerful message. But what it never asks is what does it mean to be saved? And of course we have answers for that too. And those answers are not in the whole wrong answers. Um, but sometimes when we read the Bible, we ought to question whether or not they are sufficiently full. In other words, we might be able to say that our definition of salvation that is available to Jew and Greek and male and female and slave and free is on the right road, but the question sometimes we need to ask is not, is it on the right road, but does it go far enough down the right road? And here's what I'm getting at. In Galatians, Paul gives this entire chapter to the discussion of how we are justified, how we were brought into the body of Christ, what Jesus is doing on the cross. He ends with this magnificent conclusion that if you are baptized into Christ, you uh, are clothed in Christ, and in Christ there is no more slave, nor free, nor male, nor female, nor uh, Jew, nor Greek. But what we oftentimes miss is that Paul, when writing Galatians, didn't sit down and just say, okay, now we're at chapter 3, and now it's time to talk about justification. Now it's time to talk about how we're saved, how we get into the body of Christ. We were talking about some other things before, but we're done with those other things. They're not really related to this, so now we're going to talk about this. Mm -hmm. um, that's not the way we see Paul working. Rather, in Galatians, as the example we're using this morning, Paul begins by talking about a social issue within the body of Christ. He's talking to a group of people who are fighting over this dichotomy of Jew and Greek, and this dichotomy of Jew and Greek is spilling over into the way that the church actually lives its life together. And so the Jews, in a variety of ways, are telling the Greeks who have been baptized into Christ, who have come to faith in Christ Jesus, who have been privy to and party to all of the things he talks about in Galatians chapter 3, the same as those Jewish Christians have. The Jews are telling the Greek Christians, you're not good enough. And so we're going to eat over here, and you guys eat over there. And we're going to do things over here this way, and you guys do things over there that way. And since we're doing certain things over here that are related to our Jewishness, and you don't do those things, that means that you are somehow less than we are. And the story that he gives to kind of highlight this is a story of when he was in Antioch. And Peter comes up from Jerusalem to be with the church in Antioch for a while. And there was a time where everything was going well. Antioch, a primarily Gentile area with some Jewish Christians mixed in as well, had a lot of unity going on. And Peter, when he was there, he was eating with the Gentile Christians, the Jewish Christians. There was no Gentile table and Jewish table. There was no, we're better than you. There was no, you have to do things the way we do things before you can really count as a Christian. And then Paul says these Christians from Jerusalem come who uh, bought into that dichotomy. They liked building that wall, and Peter all of a sudden was eating at the Jewish table. And Paul says that he confronted Peter. 
And if you go back to Galatians chapter 2, it is out of this circumstance, this social reality that Paul found himself in, that the early church was struggling with, it was out of that that he enters into the conversation about justification, about how we get into Christ. Paul only brings it up as a way of getting to verses 27 and 28. And 27 and 28 exist in the context of Galatians as a way of addressing the Jewish table, Gentile table, we're better than you, you ought to do business like us. In other words, for Paul, the whole point of bringing in justification and how we get into Christ is to highlight the fact that when we are saved, that brings about a new social reality. Not just Jews and Greeks can both be saved. Not just male and female can both be saved. Not just slave and free can both be saved. But when we enter into this thing that we have called salvation, when we enter into Christ, that brings about a new reality that changes the way that we do things. All of a sudden, the Jewish table and the Gentile table is not good enough anymore. Because even though you are still uniquely Jewish, there is that individual aspect, you are still uniquely Gentile, you have also entered into a reality where you are now uniquely and overwhelmingly Christian. And so what I've noticed is this, every time Paul, who is the primary one who talks about justification, how we get into Christ, it was one of one of his gigs, this is one of the things that he liked to do. Every time Paul talks about this, you will notice that what Paul is doing when he talks about justification, like he does in Galatians, is that he's using that as a tool to get us to this new reality where everything has changed. And so in Ephesians chapter 2, we have the same sort of thing. In Ephesians chapter 2, there... Paul, in the first 10 verses, talks about how we are saved. Those famous verses. Uh, For you have been saved by faith, not through works, lest any man should boast. That's the passage from that that we always remember. Uh, But what most people don't do is they don't read on past verse 10, kind of the culmination of that justification talk, to verse 11. In verse 10, Uh, leading up to, he talks about how we are brought into Christ by faith, not of works, that God has created us to do certain things by his own grace. And then in verse 11, he spends the rest of the chapter, the vast majority of the chapter, talking about how from that flows this new reality where the Jews and the Gentiles have been brought together. They have both been brought close to God. The enmity and the animosity that exists between them has been destroyed. And the phrase Paul uses there is where, as there used to be two groups, now there is one in Greek, one new humanity. The discussion in 1 through 10 is serving the point that Paul wants to drive home that now in Christ you are one new humanity. Romans is, uh, although much longer and in a more complicated way, the same sort of story. Uh, Paul goes on at length for the first um, 10 chapters, 11 chapters, talking about in various ways, from various angles, this notion of salvation and what it means to be in Christ and who we are in Christ. And all of this leads up to this practical application. This is what it means for you starting in chapter 12, and the highlight of that discussion in chapter 12 is chapters 14 and 15. Chapters 14 and 15 is where when Paul, speaking to a particular group of Christians in a particular place at a particular time with particular struggles, addresses those struggles and says, all of you guys who are over here forming this camp and this camp need to get over what you're doing because if all of those things I said in the first 11 chapters mean anything, it means that you can't do business this way. And so I think that to put it in simpler terms, what Paul is getting at here, and this is kind of the point that I wanted us to drive home this morning, is that for Paul, salvation was not a change of state from unsaved to saved. For Paul, salvation was not primarily a thing that happened to individuals. It includes individuals. It inescapably involves individuals. You can't get past your individual choice to come into the body of Christ. But for Paul, what you are doing when you are saved is you are coming into the body of Christ. Christ. 
salvation itself for Paul, it would seem, is not just the washing away of sins, is not just the promise of eternity with God, but is the entrance into a new community, a new way of doing business with one another, that it is inescapably and necessarily and essentially social. And for Paul, that has wide-ranging consequences. Because we live in a world, and the church is prone just as much as anybody else to put up walls over a variety of different issues. In Paul's day, they would erect walls over Jews and Gentiles, and they would say on the Jewish side that you have to do things this way, and the Gentiles, by the way, would look down condescendingly on their Jewish brothers who were still behind the times and say, ha, we're obviously better than you. We still have freedom in Christ. And he would say, you're both missing the point. In our day, we do it over a variety of things. We, after all, come from the movement that commonly built black churches back in the day so that our black sisters and brothers would have places to worship without bothering us, or as we would think, they being bothered by us, although we could see through that, and we felt proud about that. So we, of course, are the ones who will often stick our Hispanic sisters and brothers in the basement and then brag about how we support Hispanic Christians, although we don't really know much about them or who they are or what their needs are. We are, of course, the ones who divide over how we worship or sometimes what translation of the Bible we use or whether the songs we sing are old or new or how we sing or play those songs or how many song leaders we have or how many communion cups we use or how often we take communion or whether or not we have elders or deacons and the list goes on and on and on and on and on. And it's not to suggest that all of those issues are not um, important. Some of them aren't but I don't have time to adjudicate those this morning either. But it is to suggest that if we are going to lay claim to salvation, if we are going to call ourselves Christians, we must understand that this reality that Christ draws us into is more fundamental than all of the fights that we have. We have to understand that this reality, this new humanity that Christ calls us into is one that essentially destroys all of those barriers. And so if I am willing and content to sit over here, never interacting with my sisters and brothers over there because they have a different skin tone or they worship a different way or they use a different Bible or they see this issue or that issue a different way and just let it be like it is. I haven't figured out what salvation is about yet. Because salvation is not just about me and God. Salvation is not just my personal relationship with Jesus. Salvation is the entrance into a new community. And um, when I grew up, this was a problem that we had in conservative churches. We were over-concerned with the purity of the church, and so we were very quick to discharge anybody who might threaten the purity of the church, ask too many questions, come up with answers that we didn't think were the right answers, and, and you were put on a blacklist. I think I told this story before in, in some sort of setting that was recorded online, or maybe it was in a sermon of the few weeks that we met live, but I remember a man coming to speak for us when we were at the School of Preaching who was well known in uh, those circles of the Churches of Christ. And when he came to speak, he looked tired and beleaguered. This was because he was in the middle of this theological battle uh, over the role of the Holy Spirit. And it wasn't necessarily because of his view of the Holy Spirit. I don't think that anyone actually knew what his view of the Holy Spirit was. But Group A said that he associated with Group B, and Group A didn't like the way Group B talked about the Holy Spirit. So he, person C, tangentially related, was drawn into that battle, and they would attack him at every chance they could. Not because of what he said or what he believed even, but because he was associated with somebody they disagreed with. And so I grew up, and this was, this was part and parcel of the way we did business in the corners I grew up in. So I grew up in a church where 
we were hesitant, would have been scandalized to worship with our progressive or our liberal sisters and brothers. We would be hesitant to even call them in some instances sisters and brothers. And to people who find themselves in that position, I just want to say that the gospel calls you past all of that. If your gospel cannot include your progressive or your liberal sisters or brothers, you're not preaching the gospel. And if your salvation is not big enough for you to enter into life and wrestle with and work through issues with your progressive and liberal sisters and brothers, your salvation isn't the salvation the Bible's selling. But on the other side of that, there is a form of progressivism and liberalism today that is equally and just as legalistically interested in purity. And so only people who meet the standards of that progressivism are allowed. If you've ever said the wrong thing, if you've ever done the wrong thing, if you don't have things exactly right, if you haven't arrived at the place that we've arrived at, if you see anything different, then there's just no room for you. And to those who find themselves in that position, if you don't have room for your conservative sisters and brothers, then your gospel is not the gospel of the Bible, no matter how much of it you've gotten right. And if your vision of the kingdom of heaven, which is essentially what we're talking about when we are talking about salvation, you remember Colossians 1, 13 and 14, we have been rescued from the power of darkness and delivered into the kingdom of his beloved son through whom we have forgiveness and deliverance of sins. Um, if your vision of the kingdom of heaven doesn't, include people who disagree with you and get things wrong then your vision is not that of the kingdom of heaven and so all that to suggest that we have some serious work to do in our divided nation where we're interested in taking sides we've got some work to do because at the end of the day it is the new humanityness. It is the no Jew, no Greek, no slave, no free, no woman, no manness, no male, no femaleness of the church that sets it up to be light in the darkness of the world. And if we're over here building walls and pointing fingers the same as everybody else in the world, instead of entering into the very real and very hard and very difficult work of being reconciled with one another, of working through differences, of understanding one another, of having grace for one another, of calling one another to account in humble and sincere ways, then um, I don't know what hope the world has. So let me call you to a bigger salvation. Let me call you to a bigger version of the kingdom. Let me call you to a bigger way of thinking about what it means to be in Christ. Not an easier way. Oh man, I can feel my blood pressure rising just thinking about it. But a better way. Let me pray for you and then pray with me. Father, break down the walls in our hearts. Help us to see in every person that passes someone made in the image of God. Someone you have declared worthy of dying for. Someone you love immeasurably. And Father, give us eyes that see the way you see. And give us ears that hear the way you hear. And hearts that comprehend the way you comprehend. We come to you now. We pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive our debts as we've forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory now and forever. Amen. We'll pull out my handy dandy sheet of paper and we will remember who we are. We shall love the Lord our God with all our hearts and with all our soul and with all our mind and with all our strength. This is the first and greatest commandment and the second commandment is like it. We shall love our neighbor as ourselves.
All of the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. We love because God first loved us. And anyone who says that they love God but hates their brother or sister is a liar. How are you going to love God whom you have never seen if you don't love your brother or sister who is right in front of you? So this is the command we have from him. Those who love God must also love their brother and sister. Church, we love you. We miss you. Have a great week.